Okay. Welcome, everybody. My name is Felicia Williamson. I'm the Director of Library and Archives at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. I want to welcome you here this evening to our History Highlights program, The Road to Liberation. I would like to start by thanking our wonderful community partners, the Green Hill School, the Legacy Senior Communities, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Shalom, and the Holocaust, Genocide, and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. Thank you so much for your support of the museum and our programs. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to our museum members, board members, and volunteers who are watching tonight. And if you'd like to learn more about volunteering or joining the museum as a member, please go to dhhrm.org. We will leave time for questions at the end, and we really do promise that we'll engage in an active Q&A session at the end. And if you would go and use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen and type out and submit your questions there at any time as we go, that will be the best way for us to interact with your questions. And then at this point, I want to take a moment to thank our donors of the Maxi Collection, the Maxi Whitehead family. Um, without our archival donors, our collection, well, it would be a snooze and it would be empty. So that would be a, a shame. Um, and, you know, when we meet with donors and ask them to entrust the museum with their collections, it's often emotional and um, it takes a lot of trust. And so we just want to take a moment to thank the Maxi family for doing that. Um, and, uh, and then at this point, I'll turn it over to two very uh, important people. That is Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson. She's the Barbara Raven Chief Education Officer. I call her Abosh, so it's hard for me to spit all of that out at once. Uh, she's been, been with the museum 10 years and she's the fearless leader of the education team. And she'll be launching our talk tonight, talking about liberators and what they encountered. And then, and very special to us in the library and archives team is Ann Hanish. She's our project cataloger brought on to help us with a huge cataloging project, but significant to this, she processed this collection that we're gonna talk about tonight. And she has a degree in military history, which is great news because that is something that we needed to add to our team knowledge base. And so we're so grateful for that. So buckle up, let's learn together. One of my favorite things to do, and I'm gonna hand it over to them. Thank you so much, Felicia. Uh, and the bulk of the heavy lifting today is going to be done by, by uh, Ms. Hanish. Uh, I'm just gonna do a little bit of scene setting for you on liberation. Uh, and the American involvement in the war. And then we're gonna move right into what we call the Maxi Collection. So um, to make this clear scene setting for uh, our, um, oh, hold on. I'm gonna wait for Anne to pull up the slides. Here we go. Okay, so scene setting for American involvement in World War II. This will be from the US troops perspective uh, and not uh, ultimately as liberators and not from the perspective of Holocaust survivors. So this is a bit of a, of a different focus uh, for us. And that is why uh, the Maxi Collection is uh, so wonderful in enabling us to do this. Um, so. Uh, can we go back the one slide just to the to the uh, cover slide and yeah we'll just leave it there for a moment. Um, America in the 1930s is largely uh, isolationist uh, and it is going to remain that way uh, in many ways until the end of 1941 and the Japanese attack uh, at Pearl Harbor on December 7th 1941, which is followed almost immediately on uh, December 11th by Hitler and Germany's declaration of war against the United States, which in many ways gives uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, our president, the permission that he has been long seeking to get involved in the Jap in the uh, European theater. Um, and obviously he's going to have to deal with the Pacific theater as well. The first year and a half or so, after um, 
the bombing of Pearl Harbor is taken up by a number of developments in the United States. First of all, rearmament. Uh, we are in desperate, desperate uh, shape at this point. We are in no position to go to a major fighting war. Um, it's also uh, almost immediately following the uh, attack at Pearl Harbor, the um, President issues Executive Order 9066, and in that, in its wake, begins to intern uh, Japanese Americans in a in a series of of camps. Um, you see the ramping up of war production across the United States. You see the ultimate creation of a large uh, military, uh, which, when it initially starts training, uh, and I know this, you know, from things that I've accounts that I've read, and also from my father, who was a World War uh, II veteran when they were originally training and these were these were m1 rifles at the time so this takes us back a ways they were training frequently with wooden cutouts of rifles i mean that was how under under um supplied we were fast forward to about 1943 and the united states has been engaged in um some conflicts in uh north africa and ultimately we begin to hit Europe and we come up through Sicily and the Italian boot, um, but that's slow slog fighting. It's, it's, it's painful fighting, but what it means is that American troops as they come into Europe um, begin to see real combat. Fast forward again to 1944, and in June of 44, we hit the D-Day invasion. And obviously I'm, I'm leaving out vast uh, swaths of history, but I just want to give you a sense of how this develops from, from isolation to being, to being hit at Pearl Harbor, to beginning to rearm, to actually starting to send troops overseas in any kind of large numbers, and then to begin to engage with, with uh, the enemy, particularly in the European theater, because that's our focus here. Um, the D-Day invasion, uh, June, June 6th of 1944, is our first engagement on the mainland where we land directly on the mainland. And, and I'm not telling you anything that, that you don't know as far as, as that goes. And that's the uh, invasion at Normandy in France. All of that leads to a lot of major engagements and fighting of US troops, British troops, Free French troops um, on the uh, from the Atlantic, so from the from the western side of Europe, heading inland toward Germany. While at the same time, on the eastern side of Europe, coming out of European Russia and through through Eastern Europe, you have the Soviet troops begin to be pushing back in the opposite direction. So what's going to happen is a pincer movement, and ultimately by forty five, you were going to have the um, Germans basically being squeezed between the, the two sets of allied forces uh, as everybody pushes back into Germany. Why is this significant for our purposes? Well, because one of the things that the Americans who are now by, by, by January of 45, these are, these are battle-hardened troops. These are troops who have seen a lot of action, um, there's been a lot of, of, of hard fighting, a uh, lot of death of, 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 you know, comrades in arms, but what they have not seen in all of this is something that comes to be a hallmark for us of what happened in Europe under Nazi occupation of the European continent. And that is the incarceration of Jews, but many, many others as well, in concentration camps across Europe. Um, ultimately, there are between 43 and 44,000 forced labor, POW, uh, concentration camps, uh, death camps, there's only six of them, but there's this vast slave labor camp that looks, that looks like a web from the Atlantic all the way uh, over to Soviet Europe. That, that's as, as, as far over as it goes. And for our purposes, the reason it's significant is as follows. Once liberation begins, and, and liberation actually uh, begins in um, very, very late 
uh, 44, when uh, the Soviets in, in July of 44 liberate the, the death camp of Majdanek, which is at, at Lublin. Um, so that's the first liberation that occurs. But then the next liberation doesn't happen until January of 45. And that's another death camp. That's Auschwitz-Birkenau. The reason the death camps are liberated by Soviets and not American or uh, American Western allies is because the death camps are all in Poland and Polish territory is, is on the Eastern side of the allied advance. So this is the advance that the Soviets are gonna do. For our purposes, what American troops are gonna see is not the liberation of death camps, but the liberation of concentration camps. And the first concentration camp that the Americans are gonna come upon, um, can you go to the next slide, please, Anne? Thank you so much. So the first concentration camp um, that American personnel are going to get to in 1945 is going to be Ordruf. And this is a picture of Ordruf, uh, O-H-R-D-R-U-F. Ordruf is one of 88 subcamps of Buchenwald. It's the first one our troops get to. And within a, a week of this happening, a week and a half, Eisenhower, along with Generals Patton and George C. Marshall, come and tour Ordruf because they want to see what it was happening on the ground. And- um, Hey, Bosh, could you just locate yeah. for people where Buchenwald is geographically? Oh, I'm sorry. So, so Ordruf is next to Buchenwald. Buchenwald is just north of Weimar. So it's in, it's in the center of Germany. Um, so, so America is in Germany at this point. This is the first camp uh, that we liberate. Um, and again, it's one of multiple camps that belong to Buchenwald. And in talking about this, General Eisenhower, who's the Supreme Allied Commander at this time, writes a, a three-page letter um, that says secret stamped all over it, which has subsequently been crossed out because it's, it's no longer that secret. Um, anyway, April 15th, 1945, and he's writing uh, this note to, um, to uh, Chief of Staff, and he says the following midway through this three-page letter. He says, on a recent tour of the forward areas in first and third armies, I stopped momentarily at the salt mines in Germany to take a look at the German treasure. There is a lot of it, but the most interesting, although horrible, sight that I encountered during the trip was a visit to a German internment camp near Gotha. What he means is this, um, Order of this subcamp of Buchenwald. The things I saw beggar description. While I was touring the camp, I encountered three men who had been inmates and by one ruse or another had made their escape. I interviewed them through an interpreter. The visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty, and bestiality were so overpowering as to leave me a bit sick. In one room where they were piled up 20 or 30 naked men killed by starvation, George Patton would not enter. He said he would get sick if he did so. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give firsthand evidence of these things if ever in the future there develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to, and he puts this in quotation marks, the word propaganda. I mean, so, so, so he's shocked by this. American troops are shocked by this. This really rattles them to the core. Um, shortly after this, on April 11th, Buchenwald, the main camp that this was a subcamp of, is uh, liberated. And we have um, actually a letter, I won't read it to you, but this is a letter from Third Army signed by George Patton, because he's writing to uh, my dear Ike. He's letting Eisenhower know that they found another camp. And he doesn't know in this letter that the two camps are part of the same camp. In other words, we're not all that sure what it is that we're coming across uh, at this point. Um, that was April 11th, 1945. And then what we should do is fast forward. Let's go to the next slide. Um, again, these are American soldiers who are viewing this because what Eisenhower then does on April 19th is he sends out a telegram which says eyes only on it. Um, and it was declassified in 1960. Um, and uh, it's from Eisenhower to General Marshall. 
And it says, I have visited one of these camps myself, and I assure you that whatever has been printed on them to date has been an understatement. If you would see any advantage in asking about a dozen leaders of Congress and a dozen prominent editors to make a short visit to this theater, meaning this theater of war, in a couple of C-54s, I will arrange to have them conducted to one of these places where the evidence of bestiality and cruelty is so over overpowering as to leave no doubt in their minds about the normal practices of the Germans in these camps. Um, and, and again, here's a, it's a, and these are all from the Eisenhower uh, uh, presidential library. Um, and American troops, as I said, battle hardened, used to stuff at this point are horrified. Some of them, when they see this, throw up. Some of them break down and cry. Some of them give their rations in an effort to, to help the survivors that they're finding in these places. They really, they weren't expecting this. I mean, they had they had a notion that there was slave labor done. It's in our newspapers. But what that meant and what that was going to look like, they had no idea. And then on April 29th, as we fast forward from there, Dachau is liberated by the American troops. And Dachau itself is one camp with about 140 subcamps. It's huge. And it goes all the way across Southern Germany, across, across the Bavarian area there. And I am going to step out now and turn things over to Anne because Anne will deal with the Maxi collection um, because, because Mr. Maxi was one of the liberators of Dachau. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. This is uh, one slide that I left out. This is just that quote that I read you um, from, from the, um, uh, the three-page secret letter from Eisenhower to Washington. And this is actually on the side of one of the buildings that makes up the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum because it's such an incredibly powerful quote that they had it reproduced here. That's all that is. Okay, sorry, Anne. All right, thank you so much. All right, let me get this going. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Abosh. Um, tonight, I'm going to be speaking specifically about the Henry Lee Maxey collection and what it is we learned about him by studying his artifacts. Uh, Private First Class Henry Lee Maxey served in the 42nd Infantry Division. His collection was donated to us at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum in 2017, and I had the opportunity to process it. Before I begin speaking about the collection, um, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the history of the 42nd Infantry Division and how it received its name. It was originally formed on August 1st, 1917, and included units from 26 different states plus the District of Columbia. During its formation, Douglas MacArthur said it was a division that would, quote, stretch over the whole country like a rainbow. In honor of this, they wear a patch shaped like a rainbow that has red, gold, and blue. They were dis um, deactivated after World War I and then reactivated on July 14th of 1943 to include three new regiments, the 222nd, which is what Maxi served in, the 232nd and the 242nd. After their training, they were deployed to Europe and arrived in Marseille, France in December of 1944. From there, they traveled through Europe and on April 29th, as Avosh said, they participated in the liberation of over 30,000 prisoners at Dachau concentration camp. The division ended the war on occupation duty in Austria, and then ultimately it was deactivated on July 29th, 1946. So that's a little history about the 42nd. Um, now for what we learned about Maxi is how I'm going to refer to him. Um, throughout this presentation, what we learned about him by processing his collection. So Henry Lee Maxey, we learned, was born on May 3rd, 1919 in Chilton Falls County, Texas to Walter Lee Maxey and Hattie Coyle Powell. 
we know that on October 16th, 1914, I'm sorry, 1940, he registered for the secret or for the selective training and service. Here, here you can see an artifact from his collection. On September 16th, 1940, President Roosevelt signed into law the Selective Training and Service Act, which created the first peacetime draft in US history. By law, all males aged 21 to 36 were required to register for the draft with the Selective Service System. We know that on October in 1944, he joined the 42nd Infantry Division. You can see a photograph from his collection here. He was in Company C of the 222nd Infantry Regiment in the 42nd Infantry Division. He is photographed here in the front row, second from right, wearing the red cross on his helmet. The message on the back is written to his mom and his family talking about his soldiers. And um, it does refer, I thought this was very interesting. It refers to the Krauts as he referred to them, calling them the SS devils. And in 42nd Infantry lore, um, they captured a German prisoner who said, are you part of Roosevelt's SS? I'll just jump in here and say yeah. that Anne came and got me when she found that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought well, I right. also like that he refers to them as a swell bunch of guys. It's very yeah. nice in the 40s. So, well, all right. So, we know that in December of 1944, they were deployed with the 42nd to Europe. Um, this map actually came in as part of the collection. It's a campaign map. And the donors, before they donated it, took it to a conservator, which we are incredibly grateful for. So, you can see that there were some repairs done on the edges, but it's in beautiful condition. Um, it does show the Rainbows Division's movements through Europe starting in Marseille, France, and ending in occupation duty in Austria. There's illustrations throughout. Um, one of them does refer to the liberation of Dachau near Munich on the top right corner. All right, also through processing his collection, we know that he received the medical service badge. Uh, we have the article as well as the badge. The article discusses um, what the badge is and how it was awarded to Maxi. According to discharge papers, we know that it was awarded on January 29th, 1945. As you can see in the badge, the caduce is topped with a cross and then bordered by an oak leaf wreath. Um, the back has a pin and roller clasp that is soldered onto the center. This badge was awarded to US Army medical personnel who provided medical support during combat during World War II. Although it was created in January 1945, the badge was awarded retroactively to December 1941. All right, also going through his collection, we know that he spent time in France, Germany, Austria, and Salzburg, Austria. We have an example of this in one of his postcards, which is written to mom and it says something from Europe. Right. We also know through his collection that he, as a member of the 42nd, was there for the liberation of Dachau concentration camp on April 29th, 1945. So included in his collection is the mimeograph which is the testimony of Dachau concerning the liberation, which is written by James Kreisman on May 1st, 1945. Now, James Kreisman was a broadcaster who served with the 42nd, and he was there to witness and document the death trains, crematoriums, gas chambers, and then ultimately the liberation. Also included in the collection is another clipping titled 32,000 Liberated, and this article is available online, but it also covers the liberation and it gives really exclusive details about um, the gas chambers, the deceased victims, 
death trains, what it is that the soldiers saw when they encountered the camps, um, including some interactions with SS officers. All right. We learned also that Maxi moved through Germany to Austria. We have a postcard that is to his mother um, and covers his time in Zellem Ziller and thanks them for a package that he had recently received. So this is during occupation duty in Austria. Also from the collection is his pass that is um, translated into Russian, English, and French. You can see also that it lists him as being in Company C, 202nd Infantry. All right, and then through his separation qualification record, we know that in December 1945, he returned to the United States. He was, a, according to the record, he served as a dental technician in the 222nd Medical Detachment in France, Germany, and Central Europe. We know that he was honorably discharged at Camp, Fan Camp Fannin, Texas. He married in June 14th, 1947, and passed away on April 10th, 1998. Also in his collection is a Bronze Star. So we know that he won the Bronze Star Medal, or was awarded, I should say, the Bronze Star Medal. His name is engraved on the back. And then the Bronze Vs attached to the ribbon distinguish the award of a Bronze Star Medal for acts of valor and heroism during combat. So this I'm is gonna also... jump in and say it's mm -hmm. really rare to have an engraved ex example and it's rare to get the box with the metal. We don't also usually get all the pieces, a complete metal with all the pieces. So mm -hmm. having all that together is, I get made fun of for saying things like this, but it's a slam dunk. Absolutely. Uh, we also have in the collection, and this is kind of what led us to most of our discovery in terms of his military service, but his United States service record book. Um, using this, I was able to determine that he entered the service on March 2nd, 1942. I learned that he was transferred from training to Fort Bliss, Texas, to Ellington Field Hospital, which is near Houston. Um, on March 11th, 1942. And then he was also promoted to the final rank of private first class in February, 1943. So service record books are phenomenal for tracking a soldier during World War II <laughs> since don't always have those. All right, so once I was able to determine the timeline through who he was and what he did, I got to start processing it, which is the fun part. All right, how I started processing it. So the first step, anytime a collection comes in is to rehouse it using archival supplies. So as mentioned before, our donor took it to a conservator. So most of it came in archival supplies um, already or archival storage. The only kind of rehousing that we had to do was to organize it and then also just number it based on our accession number and our systems. The collection originally contained about 200 photographs, 55 archives, which includes letters, postcards, and then 14 objects. Um, and that included the metal, which you saw, um, ribbon bars, and um, coins. So once we did have it rehoused and ready, I got to do the research. And my first step was to create a personal timeline for Maxi. So using the archives and the objects that I have in front of me, I was able to kind of map out who he was, where he was, and what he did during the war. And then I also was able to use the research that I had on the 42nd to kind of um, verify where I thought he was based on where his division was at that time. 
So for this, I use the 42nd Rainbow Infantry Division Combat History of World War II, which is um, their division book. It's also available online. I use the digital collections at the National World War II Museum um, to verify a lot of the images. And then I did a lot of traveling and research via Google and Google Earth. So that was to help kind of establish who Maxi was for me. And then I mapped out the 42nd campaign. So looked at where they were trained, where they entered France, and then where they ultimately um, ended during occupation duty in Austria. And then I started to catalog. So cataloging included creating a record with a title, date, location, and description. And since not everything had a caption on the back, I had to use context clues. So we'll get a little into that. All right, so context clues that I used. Um, there was a series of photographs that showed a ceremony. And one of the photos out of about 20 did have a handwritten caption on the back that said, General Keys and General Clark shaking hands between the lineup. So I gathered all those photos that I could find that depicted that ceremony and started my research on that. So using research, I was able to determine that this photograph of soldiers were in fact from the 42nd Infantry Division. Um, and this was from a ceremony that actually celebrated the two year anniversary of the reactivation of the 42nd Infantry Division, which was held in Salzburg, Austria, dated 1945, July 14th, which included General Elwood Keyes and General Mark Clark shaking hands in the background. I'm just going to say you don't get that kind of all star cataloging work all over the place, guys. So thumbs up. Thank you. It's really fun. It's it's a, being a history detective, history detective slash Google Earth traveler, which is phenomenal. Um, as I showed before, we did have the postcard that he wrote to his mother that set, took place in Zellenziller, Austria. That he wrote in 1945. So using the image that was on that postcard, I was able to determine that photos that he had taken in that same area were from that location. So I compared the geography of that town as well as the church steeple, looked a lot church steeples. But I was able to determine that a series of photographs all took place in that location. All right, another example of context clues, um, this photograph, had a caption on the back that said, front of our hotel in Miesbach, Germany. So using that and researching Miesbach, Germany, I was able to determine that. Ah. Photographs he took as well in that city, in front of that building with fellow soldiers were also taken in Miesbach, Germany. So you can see the front exterior of the building matches the hotel. And then just to confirm, I did look up the fountain in Miesbach, Germany, which matched this one right here. I believe it was uh, St. Michael the Archangel that is depicted on that fountain. Uh, sometimes you think outside of the box. So by looking on eBay, I found a postcard of 1970 market in Miesbach, Germany. And I looked at the church area and was able to determine that these photos that mention a church being dismissed on a Sunday matched the location of the Miesbach market. Another really neat thing about this collection is that he had his camera with him the entire time and he really was able to capture a lot of that day-to-day -day life of the soldiers. So 
while they were traveling through Austria. And like, as I mentioned before, there's over 200 photographs, um, but I kind of grouped them into series just to show that these were photographs of them traveling by train through Austria. Also, we get to see through this collection, just life at camp. See their tents, we see their hygiene, we see them washing their faces and brushing their teeth with their buckets. Um, just day-to-day -day life that is not always depicted in collections that this collection allowed us to not only see, but also we can use it when researching other collections. We love photos like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit less glamorous than some other photos, but that's the kind of stuff that history nerds love to find mm -hmm. in collections and archives. So we love it when stuff like that lands across our desk. So hooray. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we also got to see just photos of him messing around with his friends um, during drill. So I chose these five photos. However, there are plenty more of them. Um, just facing the camera. And then he took photos during drill or during um, ceremonies, messing around, just again, that day-to-day -day life that you never know what's captured in the photograph. If it's a location that will help you locate another photograph in another collection, or sometimes it's a person that goes between different collections. So every picture tells a story and we are always so grateful. Um, to process those and have that opportunity. I also wanted to show you just a few more artifacts that were included in the collection. We do have his Good Conduct Medal, um, his Campaign Medal Ribbon, an AWOL membership card from the 222nd that refers to him as Henry L. Maxey, Company C, and a Queen Victoria coin. All right, so there's still so much work to be done. We continue to receive donations. We continue to process those donations and we continue to put those online so they are accessible to the public. You, if you want to see the rest of this collection, it is available online. Um, just type in Henry, L, Henry Lee Maxey into the search bar um, and it will pull up. Everything has been digitized, as I mentioned before. All photographs have been digitized. All of his artifacts were photographed um, and then cataloged with the information in terms of their description, location, uh, dates when we could match it up, and then locations, which is why that research was vital. Also, there are res more resources for reading, um, including the resources that I use. These are some additional ones through uh, USHMM, which is the US uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum, they have the encyclopedia and the articles on the 42nd Infantry Division. There's also the National Guard, um, which issues articles about the 42nd Army Divisions, great resource for more um, research on the 42nd or just any additional divisions. And then as mentioned before, the, also the Rainbow Infantry Division book, which is available um, online. It has been digitized and it's a great resource. All right, we do hold copyright. And then if please visit our online catalog at um, catalog access, or if you want to email us at archives, at DHHRM with any questions that you might have. But I just wanna say thank you for your time. And again, thank you for the donors um, for making this possible. And thank you. And if you go to our, the museum's homepage at dhhrm.org, there's a research tab. If you click on that, then you can get to this website too. If you don't, um, if writing all that down is a bummer. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Okay, so let's talk about some questions. So I have a question here about the importance of personal testimony and artifacts to the museum and what we do. And the museum in our holdings has 
we estimate around 20,000 or more artifacts and testimonies in our collections. And of course, that's the source for a good amount of what's on display at the museum. We have around 300 testimonies of Holocaust and human rights um, um, individuals. And then we are um, cataloging all the time more collections and making them available online. It's um, a big emphasis to make our materials and collections accessible so they're not just on a shelf. It's a big um, um, emphasis for our division. And um, it's imperative that our team be connected to people in our community who have collections that could be historically important. So that would be a great way if anybody in our audience knows of any collections that could be important, please connect us. That's We only know the people we know and we try to connect as much as we can with community members. But of course, it's uh, I honestly still a lot or the majority of collections that we bring into the museum, it's via word of mouth. So, um, you know, I was at an event the other night talking with another head of special collections and we were just talking about how with all the, the social media and everything in the world, it's still mostly just, you know, getting to know people and being connected and, and building those trust relationships that keeps the whole thing going. Abosh, did you spot a question you wanna talk about? Um, yeah, so there were a couple of questions that came in um, from from uh, people who are watching this. One yeah. is, what is the difference between a death camp and a concentration camp? Which yeah. is an excellent question. Excellent question. Um, they are not one and the same thing. So there were six death camps, all of which were constructed in Poland, um, all of which were deliberately built behind occupied enemy lines because the, the Germans had a hammerlock on Poland. Those death camps were set up to eradicate Europe's Jewish population. So Jews were shipped in from all over occupied Europe, uh, meaning from, from, from <laughs> uh, France uh, and, and the, the coast all the way through to uh, European sections of Soviet Russia. Um, and those six death camps were meant to exterminate the Jewish population. Concentration camps are something else. Concentration camps are operated on a number of different levels, um, but the bottom line is concentration camps were meant to control uh, occupied populations and to work those populations uh, until they could no longer labor. Some of the concentration camps were meant to, to uh, re-educate or to improve behavior. Others of them were purely forced labor installations. Um, it, it just depended where they were um, and what their purpose was. Did people die in concentration camps? Absolutely, from starvation, from disease, uh, from, from lack of medical attention. But for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, they weren't there to be killed. They were there for their labor. That's very different from the death camps, which were set up exclusively to murder those people who were brought to them, mostly Jews. That, that, that's what happened. Well, and, you know, I would just add that, you know, one of the major U.S. camps, a uh, U.S. liberated camps was Dachau, which was the first camp that was found in 1933 and was the initial emphasis for that camp was for political prisoners. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that camp was an operation for, by its end for 12 years and saw a kind of significant individuals move through that camp and some of whom were there for the, the duration and, you know, was horrific, but was not the same scenario as the Maidonic. I mean, it just wasn't. Right. And and the, the one other part that I would add to this, and this is why I'm glad that Mary asked this question, is that where it gets tricky is when you're dealing with Auschwitz, because Auschwitz was both a death camp and a concentration camp. And depending on whether you were sent to the death camp side to be gassed to death or you were sent to the labor camp side, concentration camp side to work, uh, had everything to do with whether you might by some miracle survive. So many Jews were taken to off the trains. There was what they called the selection ramp. And if you were sent to the right, you were sent to labor at Auschwitz. If you were sent to the left, 
you were sent to the gas chambers. You were, you were, you were going to be gassed to death and then put into the crematorium. Um, that, that was how that worked. So to the extent that we know about Auschwitz survivors, those survivors are not survivors of the death camp. They're survivor, survivors of Auschwitz's 45 some odd uh, camps and subcamps, which are all labor camps, uh, concentration camps. That's why they have numbers on their arms because you tattoo somebody that on some level you wanna keep track of, you assign a number. Those who were, who were taken off the trains and sent, as I said, sent to the left to, to be gassed, there are no numbers, they're not assigned numbers. There's no reason to do this. Um, so that, that's how that works. Uh, Felicia, let's go back and ask some questions out of the other section and then we'll yeah. come back to this section. Yeah, I have a good question here, which is, do the archives, Ha, uh, have they received any, uh, you know, have we re received any recovered letters from soldiers describing what they saw in the concentration camps or diaries? And we have. I think what is interesting, you know, you would be surprised perhaps to know that we have letters both from inmates, people who are interned in concentration camps um, being sent out through the Red Cross. Um, we have that sort of letter, but we also have letters being sent home and diaries and what you would call, I guess, a memoir, both from the um, interned individual side and from the liberator side. We have we have several examples of both kinds of letter and diary. Um, I think the challenge for any of the letter version of that is, of course, censorship. Um, so there was censorship on both sides. Um, on the U.S. side, on the German side, so people were having to couch what they were saying um, and be careful. Um, and, and so, you know, certainly if it was getting through, they were they were being careful what they said. Now, if it was a liberator after the war was over, they were able to say, you know, I saw something horrible. I'll tell you about it when I get home. And we so we have a couple of letters like that. You know, they say, mom, dad, you're not going to believe this. You know, um, you know, you're going to see it in the papers, but it's true. Letters like that. Um, and, and when we see those things, it, it's in a way, it, to me, it's heartening. And we have some artifacts. If you come to the museum and I hope you if you haven't, that you will. We have a liberation um, section of the museum. We have an artifact where it's a Nazi flag where the liberating unit tore it down and then inscribed the flag and sent it home. Um, and this flag is inscribed with a letter to one of the um, soldiers' wives where it says, you know, we're fighting the Nazis to get home to you, which, you know, he says it better than that, um, you know, for a 19-year-old soldier or however old he was. But we actually have artifacts um, that are liberator artifacts, too. I just okay. want to jump in also on that um, and say that, yes, we do have letters that are actually have been cataloged and are available online. So um, if you, you just search look for yourself, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. If you search Dachau, I, I'm thinking specifically of a letter that exactly as you just explained, um, talks about what he witnessed. So we have that available online, as well as just the documents that we have from this collection um, that do explain in very explicit detail what it is he saw. But again, all of those are available online. Um, so please do look that up because... They are very fascinating. Do you want to talk about DP camps briefly? Yeah, so so there are a couple of questions here. Um, one is where did soldiers take liberated prisoners after they freed them? And then the other part of this is what was the reaction in the US to liberators testimonies? Did average Americans know anything about the camps ahead of the end of the war? So I'll address uh, where did soldiers take liberated prisoners after they freed them? And Anne, please feel free to jump in as well. Um, so they didn't take them anywhere. Um, what you have to remember is that as the camps are being liberated, they're being liberated by fighting troops. In other words, we are still in the midst of a war. Germany has mm. just gone through the Battle of the Bulge where they, they, they didn't win, but they almost broke through, thus the Bulge. Um, Americans took incredibly heavy, heavy casualties. Um, Americans were taken, taken prisoner and are sitting in stalags from this. Um, and so as they're liberating these camps, sometimes they have to fight like in Dachau, where they're facing sporadic gunfire from the SS uh, guards of the camp who don't want to quit. Um, in places like Ordruf and Buchenwald, they basically walk in because the, the SS have left the camp 
or have attempted to filter into the prisoner population and hide what it is that they did. But the bottom line is that American troops are no different from any other troops in the world. They're not peacekeepers with all due respect. That's not what they're, that's not what they're created to do. They're created to fight wars. And so when they come across starving prisoners, dying prisoners, barely, barely functioning prisoners in these, in these horrendous camps, they're at a bit of a loss. Um, other than giving them their rations, they don't have the medical equipment that they need with them because these, again, are, these are frontline troops. They don't have the ability to really help these former incarcerees the way they needed to be helped. The United Nations is supposed to be taking care of this. Now, when I say United Nations, I don't mean the UN as it emerges that we know it in the later 40s. I mean the allies united together are supposed to be taking care of these um, these poor unfortunates. I mean, there's no there's no other way to describe these these people at this point, but they're a disaster. And so what we find is that private aid societies, whether they're American aid societies, religious aid societies, things like the the Joint Distribution uh, uh, Committee of 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 the, it's a private Jewish organization in the United States. There are private organizations who step up and attempt to begin to do triage in these camps. People are in such bad shape in some of these camps that this is too late for many of them. Think of the British when they, when they come into Bergen-Belsen, they're so horrified and there's a major typhus outbreak that they actually, once they're able to, uh, several weeks later, they move the surviving prisoners about a mile and a half down the road to a former SS barracks installation, and they burn Bergen-Belsen to the ground because it's un it's unusable. And then they set up Bergen-Belsen, the displaced persons camp over there. Having said that, American troops have tremendous sympathy for the Jews and many of the others that they encounter in these in these camps. But there's a problem. These are the fighting troops who see them, you know, liberation plus one, liberation plus two, you know, the days after liberation. They get rotated out of the field and fresh American troops who've never seen combat or have seen combat elsewhere and never saw the liberation of these camps come in to what's left and they're disgusted not horrified, disgusted, because these, these, the survivors are unclean and they carry disease and all of the things that are related. And because they didn't liberate them, they just see this as the conditions of the way these people live. It's, it's a real problem. It gets even worse because we have people like General Patton, who's attempting to make things better by taking displaced persons and putting them into areas that are fenced so that he can help them to heal, to get better, to do these kinds of things. Patton puts displaced persons from the Baltic Republic, so from Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, who are notorious Jew haters, in with Jewish displaced persons. And the Latvians, the Lithuanians, the Estonians, and also the Ukrainians go after the Jews. And Conditions are really, really bad. Patton actually gets pulled out and they set somebody else in and they separate the factions. I mean, so th this is very, very hard in the immediate days after liberation. Months later and even years later, because the last DP camps are still operating in the very late 1940s, one, the conditions get much, much, much better. But there's something else, which is that there are all kinds of Jews who were in Poland and the East who were there when the war ended, who by 46 realized that some of their neighbors still hate them. And the Kilsey pogrom happens in Poland in, in 46, for example, where Jews who come back to Kilsey, more than 40 of them are murdered by their Polish neighbors. There's famous photos of the funeral. Well, what this does is it kicks off a furor of, of just panic amongst Jews in the East as they they fight like crazy to get West into the American zone or the British zone and out of the Soviet zone because they wanna go someplace where they're gonna be protected. And in fact, 
you start with many less people in the DP camps than you have a few years after the war ended as these people are all moving westward. So that's that's part of this process. So it's it's never as simple as Americans, we like to say, okay, the war is over, great. And you know, American troops, my father was one of them. They wanted to go home. But by the end of 45, what the heck are we still doing here? Let's go home. But for the people who lived through this, it's not over and it's not going to be over for 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 several years. So. Well, and I'll just say archivally, it's borne out in the collections we have, both from the liberator side and from the individuals going through that process. We we have we have in photographs, letters, albums, diaries, that process that that Avosh is describing described in painful detail where people who have survived four and five camps, something that I didn't even understand at a real level until I um, took this job is that, you know, most people weren't in one camp. If they survived, they usually survived several camps. Okay. You get to 45 and you've survived. That's miracle number one. The next thing that happens to you is that you are on an often three to five year journey to end up at the final destination, if you will. Most people, of course, wanted to go home. And then they realize at some point that home is not where they really are going to go. Well, there uh, is no and, home. It's and more. it's destroyed. It's not It's not available to them for, for whatever reason, anti-Semitism being high on the list. Right. And they, they decide, okay, where are we going to go? And that starts this often, usually I would say an average of five-year plan where they finally end up getting to the U.S., Israel, uh, Australia, you know, wh wherever it may be, and it's excruciating to see um, depicted in these collections it, and fascinating and instructive. Yeah, nobody uh, wants to take them in. Um, yeah. Israel doesn't become Israel until 48. So prior to 48, the British have a hammerlock on it. You cannot get into to Israel. They intercept sh ships filled with Holocaust survivors in international waters and they tow them to Cyprus. So that that's not an option. Um, America doesn't want to take people in. Um, we ultimately do take in about 80,000, but that's not just Jews. That's 80,000 out of all Refugees. of the various groups who, right. who survived. The Israelis take in the largest single amount. But what you have to also remember is that the Americans, the British, the Soviets, in the zones that they control in formerly occupied, uh, Nazi occupied uh, Europe, they force refugees, frequently not the Jews, because that, that's a whole other problem, but other refugees are forced back to where they came from. There's vast population transfers that go on in the wake of World War II, and we, we rarely talk about it. Um, and it's, it's, horrifying and unsettling for people who've just come through, you know, years and years of war. And this is without the anti-Semitism that, that the Jews face. You know, we as Americans had Poles and, and Eastern Europeans and Russians in some of our zones, and we shipped them back to the Soviets and the Soviets killed them or shipped them off to Siberia because they had been tainted by having surrendered in the West, you know, because they had been prisoners in the West. Um, these, these are real problems. And then the final uh, question that I, I, I wanted to answer in here um, was about uh, what was the reaction in the U.S. to liberator testimonies on what they found and did the average Americans know anything about the camps ahead of the war, ahead of the end of the war? And these are excellent questions. Um, I'd like to start with the second part and then we can talk about the first part. And the second part is that the average American did not know about this. I mean, even our troops didn't know about this. They knew that there were labor camps. They knew that the Nazis killed people. Um, they could read in the U.S. newspapers about, you know, scarcely a Jew due to due to survive the year in Poland. That was that was in a in a Fort Worth Star Telegram. Um, article on page A8 in 1943. And the only reason I know that is because it was featured in our old, in our old museum and I used to go and read the article. But having said that, did they know what that meant? Did they know that there were death camps? Did they know that there were concentration camps? Did they know that when they were going to liberate Dachau on April 29th, as they came through the town into, into the Dachau 
concentration camp, did they know that they were going to come across what comes to be known as, as the death train in our newsreels, where you're going to see about uh, 40 boxcars hooked together and between three and 5,000 dead Jews and others hanging out of these cars with the smell of death. They had no idea. They, they simply had no idea. And the testimonies that you're talking about here, liberator testimonies, there were very few liberator testimonies given at the time the way we understand testimonies today. Um, and I think Felicia, you can probably talk to that more specifically than I can. Um, I, and I think that's one thing that strikes our donor families is how little, and I apologize for the background, I have toddlers and a, a crotchety old cat. So it's a real cacophony over here. Um, the, I think sometimes it's really strikes our donor families, how little they knew of their parent or grandparents experiences. And there was a reason, um, the liberators who did have the most striking interaction with the death camp and uh, not the death camps, I'm sorry, with the concentration camps, um, were the most, uh, likely to be silent about what they saw because it was so, um, damaging to their, you know, to their understanding of the world. I think it really was. And um, most of them didn't talk about what they saw. I think there was a real stoicism that came with it. And, and so I know, for example, if they did talk, it was much later in life and at the behest of grandchildren or um, reunion groups, that seems to be more common, but it really wasn't very common for them to reflect immediately on what they saw and it would be brief if if so but we're always trying to capture it when we find it we do have liberator testimonies in our collection um, that's something you can search for and find and we recommend that you do check out those liberator testimonies online we have uh, i think coming close to 10 uh, between five and ten liberator testimonies where and and the liberators significantly as awash was mentioning um, and of course, Maxie also, the more medically related their duties within the army, the more interaction, and of course, this all makes total sense, the more interaction they would have had with that um, group of Holocaust survivors. It makes total sense. Um, so for example, we have a, a really interesting collection, the Kramer collection, and he was a medic. So he was stationed for a good solid three months uh, with one of the one of the camps that was liberated, which all that makes good sense. And so same thing with Maxie. He was he had medic training. So he was more interacting with the with the survivor population. So um yeah. Okay. Um, I think it's about you, yeah, there's one final question I actually want to get to because okay. it's a good one. Um this is from Scott Butnick and he's asking about immigration quotas um okay. that were enforced before the war and were they increased after the war uh for for jews who wanted to get into the u.s and the, the bottom line is no for the most part they were not um three years after the war ends in 48 they're still battling because the american public does not want to let in refugees refugees take american jobs refugees are a threat to the american way of life you know fill in the blank here do we take in some displaced persons yes we do but we don't take in nearly as many as we could have we taken about 80 80 000 all told that's it from that entire vast group of people who are displaced across europe so and, no. and i'll um, weigh in here to say we also have collections that document the incredible amount of effort those individuals had to go through to even get here after the war. And it is just amazing. Um, I, I, I would just dare anyone to say that it, it was easy because it was almost impossible. And it's really a testament to any, because we have some correspondence where the, the U.S. family is doing everything in their power. And it's really uh, astonishing. So um, I think with that, I think we might need to wrap up. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Anne. And thank you, Abosh. And thank you to our um, donors again and our audience, without whom we would just be listening to ourselves talk. And I'm not above it, but I'm glad not to be doing it. So thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thank, thank you for joining us. <laughs>